All right. It um looks like I've I've got twelve o'clock on my computer here, so I am going to get us started for out this October plan webinar. Um, uh, I am Sarah Thunberg. I am the new National Flood Insurance Program Coordinator here at the Office of Planning and Development. Um, I also have my colleague Noah Hodgetts here today. Uh, he is going to be monitoring um, the chat and uh, letting anyone in. If you have any issues, uh, just put it in the chat and uh, Noah should be able to help you out while, um, while I'm going through everything today. So I'm going to just, uh, we're going to do the presentation first and then hold questions until the end. But as you're thinking of them, um, please go ahead, type them in the chat. Uh, and then I can either address it if I uh, find a good place to uh, put it in with the presentation or um, I'll be answering everything at the end. And I imagine um, the floodplain management program is a more niche area of planning, so I imagine we're going to be getting some questions. All right, so um, I'm going to start off with let's. Um, I am sharing something um, on my screen right now. Uh, I tested it before I believe people should be able to see it um if anybody else is having an issue uh seeing the slides please um note that in the chat otherwise Judy I think it uh might be an issue with your system on your end yeah. all right so um going ahead so I'm going to start off uh, by kind of prefacing it with why we need to pay attention um, and why flood or proper floodplain management is important in planning decisions. So um, weather is it's always happening. You always you always ask what is the weather, not where or when is the weather. Um, so it's something that is always going on most days. Um, nothing significantly impactful happens. Um, but occasionally, uh, the weather can push the boundaries of what our communities and infrastructure are uh, able to handle. And while weather isn't inherently dangerous in itself, uh, it becomes a hazard when people impede the natural progression of these events and um, we have our infrastructure in hazardous and vulnerable areas. And water or anywhere it rains, it can flood. And water can be especially dangerous because it doesn't follow town lines. Um, it can quickly alter the local terrain through the sheer power and force of floodwaters. And um, it can also be very deceiving uh, to the public. Water, I mean, you see water every day. Um, you grow up next to the river. Um, it, and for the most part, it, it is not uh, a dangerous hazard. But because we get used to it when it does get hazardous it can be deceptive because it doesn't look that different from what uh, you normally experience it might just look a little higher but the force of the uh, flood waters is um, not <laughs> to be something that's taken lightly water is extremely powerful and additionally uh, about 25 to 30 percent of the flood insurance claims come from low to moderate risk areas. So that's areas that are um, either in the outskirts of the floodplain or they're not in the area designated as the floodplain. Um, and that's because, again, anywhere it rains, it can flood. And there's different ty ty types of flooding that tend to occur in um, different areas. And I'll talk about that later. So. The main thing to note is that development anywhere needs to be conscious of the flood risk and maintain effective water, man water management infrastructure. So that is maintaining uh, culverts appropriately sized, making sure those culverts are clear and you have ditches along the side of the roads and, and make sure those ditches are clear for when it floods 
you don't want there to be debris blocking the drainage. And that's how water can build up and eventually flood someone's basement and cause a lot of damage. So like every disaster, flooding has phases. Um, generally, be before the flood, uh, there's the preparation phase. And that is when communities are going over their hazard mitigation plans, gathering resources, um, building or uh, uh, giving information out to the community so that uh, residents can prepare for them or prepare themselves. And then during the flood, there is the response phase. That's primarily when your emergency managers and um, emergency assistance is being deployed as needed. Um, if someone gets stuck in the floodwaters or um, if there's some damage that happens, uh, that's when uh, we are responding to what happens with the flood. And then after the flood, for uh, the days after the flood, you're dealing with recovery. That is when people are cleaning up they're filing claims, they're rebuilding, they're just assessing what happened, what needs to be done, how can we recover to the pre-flood conditions. And then in the months to years after the flood, we learn what uh, was damaged, what was vulnerable. Uh, the flood gives communities information on how um, they can best uh, protect themselves from the floodwaters, and that involves uh, new planning and zoning decisions and regulations. Uh, that involves people purchasing uh, flood insur insurance, um, updating the hazard mitigation plans, and also building and constructing and doing terrain alterations to mitigate the floodwaters in certain areas that might have been identified as um, a a constriction area that is exacerbating the floodwaters. And th this flooding is a multi-industry issue. Um, it affects emergency management, it affects planning, it affects insurance, construction, forecasting, healthcare. Um, it's not in a single issue that one agency is able to really deal with on their own. Um, and so part of how us as planners, we can really help in floodplain management is making smart planning and zoning decisions and um, that are some of the most effective strategies, because if we don't have houses in the floodplain in the first place, there's nothing there to be a hazard or to be in the path of the floodwaters. And so that's one of the most effective ways we can keep people people and property safe is just smart planning decisions. So different types of flooding affect different areas and they need different kinds of planning. So the first one, the most common type of flooding that you think of or are familiar with is your river and inland flooding. That's generally when your water levels rise over top of the riverbanks due to excessive rainfall, persistent thunderstorms, snow melt, et cetera, just too much water and not enough space to hold it. These tend to be long durations over the course of days um, until the floodwaters can recede or even peak. Sometimes it takes multiple days for the, for the waters to peak because it takes time for the water to go from where it landed, drain into the rivers, then the rivers respond, and then the water finally reaches its way out into the oceans. And river flooding is large, it's a large area of impact. It can cover entire like downtowns for multiple towns along a river. Um, and usually these tend to stay within the mapped floodplains because it's the river itself that is rising and it spills over into the floodplains up over its banks and generally, yeah, it stays within the mapped areas. And so this is generally, it's more predictable because we know where it's going to go and because it's such a long duration, um, it's easier to predict because um, generally you have your larger storms that are much more identifiable 
um, that are the ones that, that are causing it. So these have um, are, are a lot easier to plan for than other types of flooding. Um, and then next we have storm surge or coastal flooding. Um, I'm sure you were well aware of um, this type of flooding. And this is caused by inundation of land areas along the coast that's caused by an abnormal rise in water level. Um, this can be a combination of multiple factors, um, which could be a uh, higher than average tide that happens month every month we have higher tides during the full moon and the new moon um, and throughout the year we have um, your king tides uh, your I think it's neap tides um, and just a natural variation in tides combined with your heavy rain which would increase the water level overall and then onshore winds from a strong storm physically push the waves and the water up on along the coastline and raise that by a foot or however much, um, depends on the strength of the storm. Now, these are a large area of impact. Generally, it's the entire coastline and the surrounding um, land areas. And this, th these ones, or these floodwaters also tend to stay along the mapped coast or along the coast and in the mapped floodplain areas because um, these are well known um, areas and we know where the source of the water is coming from. Um, that's the main difference between whether uh, the floodplain or, or whether the water is going to stay within the floodplain or not and how predictable it is. Um, and with these storm surge and coastal flooding events, generally it's a very large storm that's been identified for multiple days um, on approach and so we have time to predict it and then also we know when our full and our new moons are and when those peak high tides are and so um, with just the high tide flooding like we're, we're able to uh, predict that months and years out um, and then we just need to pay attention um, when we know that there's high tides coming. It, are there going to be storms around that are going to increase and exacerbate that flooding? Um, I have some pictures here of downtown Portland. We've got Jay's Oyster Bar and then the street next to it. I I took these pictures for or during the high tide of the 2022 Christmas storm where we had simultaneous uh, high astronomical tides uh, with heavy rain and snow melt and um, heavy winds that uh, brought the storm surge up. And so this was an especially hazardous event because it combined pretty much every uh, mechanism to increase water levels. And then our next type of flooding is the ones that we tend to see during the summer um when we have thunderstorms and i know the last few years we've had a lot of flash flooding events um these are caused by excessive rainfalls in a very short period of time uh generally less than six hours and uh the thunderstorms uh either it's a heavy thunderstorm or it's a thunderstorm that just doesn't move and it keeps raining on a small area or you have th thunderstorm after thunderstorm after thunderstorm. And so you have a very small area that gets rained on over and over and over again with very heavy and intense rain. Um, these flash flooding events can have upwards of five to six inches an hour. And th that would be dumped in about a mile or a half mile uh, or square mile area. So this a lot of water in a very, very smart, small area, which creates high velocity torrents of heavy rainwater that rip through the riverbeds, urban streets and mountain canyons. Um, in the top picture here, I believe this was in Groton in 2017, you can see the rainwater just ripped through this person's yard and that was that was their yard before this was all grass water didn't used to go through um the middle of their yard but now after it can change the course of the riverbed within a matter of hours to minutes and it can 
scour out all of this land around their foundation and it, it took off um, some of their siding and uh, on the on their porch. And now this all of this silt and sand has to go somewhere. So it's not that it's going to be eroding or well, part of the issue with flash flooding is that it erodes areas and the importance of have maintaining the the infrastructure to divert um, the rainwater and keeping those culverts and ditches clear is because these flash flooding events carry so much sand and gravel all the way down and it has to pile up somewhere. This was taken in Alexandria, New Hampshire uh, two summers ago. And this is at the base of multiple roads. This is a stop sign right here that is five feet high and the sand and gravel has piled up to almost a foot below it. So that's at least three to four feet of sand and gravel that just got deposited um, in this in the middle of this intersection. Um, and so just to highlight the the importance of making sure like you always have up to date culverts and uh, drainage uh, or uh, water management infrastructure that is adequate to deal with the um, or these types of flash flooding events. Now, because it's a, such a small area of impact and such a short duration, these are very low predictability events because we know when the atmosphere, or we know when a thunderstorm, when the environment is capable of producing a thunderstorm like this, but actually predicting which town is it going to land in and what side of the town is it going to land in um, so you can evacuate people, that's, um, that only happens within an hour or a few hours of the thunderstorm. And so because of this, um, flash flooding events, while they are so devastating, they're also very low predictability. And our last type of flooding event that I wanted to talk about today is ice jam flooding. And we do see this in New Hampshire. This is generally, well, it happens in the winter um, and spring months when you have the river has frozen over with ice over the course of the winter. And then it's temperatures are getting warmer. It's starting to break up and get flushed downstream. And what happens is chunks of ice pile up at narrow river channels or at um, where bridges cross the river. And they very quickly restrict the flow of water. And then the water starts building up upstream of that jam and it creates uh, flooding in the surrounding areas. Now, these are variable durations because it's going to last for as long as that uh, block of ice is stuck. And that could get dislodged in a matter of hours, or it could stay uh, stuck for days. So um, the ice jam flooding, it's, it, yeah, it's variable duration, depending on how long um, that block is going to be there for. And then it's got a large area of impact. It backs up all the way up the river. Um, and then this one also spreads out along the mapped floodplain adjacent to the riverbed. And because this is kind of a random event of whether or not ice gets stuck, um, it is a lower predictability. Um, we do know that uh, whether the ice is thick enough or thin enough to uh, maybe be able to break. And so um, forecasters are able to say the ice is in a state where it could start bunching up. But aside from that, um, there's very little ability to actually say that it ice is going to start breaking up and then get blocked here. And then we're going to get um, flooding for this many days until it um, until the jam breaks up. Uh, unfortunately, the forecasting and modeling is just not good enough to uh, be able to give that level of detail. Um, <clears throat> So I've got a series of images here showing the Yukon River in Alaska near Galena, where there's an ice jam just off screen here. And this is the first day. And then within a matter of hours, um, you can see the water is starting to build up behind that ice jam upstream of the river. And then it keeps building and building 
and building until eventually the entire town can be flooded uh, due to these ice jams. And then all of this flooding has very costly um, effects. And this is the 2023 billion dollar weather and climate disaster uh, map produced by FEMA annually. And the 2024 one, since the year is not done, uh, that has not been released yet. But you can already see we had a northeast or a nor'easter winter storm last year that also produced a lot of flooding. Our winter storms and flooding tend to go um, hand in hand in New England just because of the sheer amount of water that and uh, that snow can hold. And then uh, the other very, very costly disasters were um, flooding, 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 and then just uh, your general severe storms in the Midwest that happens every year. That's unavoidable, essentially. But um, yeah, some of the largest or most impactful disasters are flooding. And it is also the third most likely and challenging um, threats for communities. Um, this slide right here just ranks uh, different hazards and threats um, by their likeliness and um, how stressful it is on the community. And flooding right here is the third most likely after cyber attack and the pandemic, but it's more likely than an active shooter, an earthquake, wildfires, uh, tornadoes. And flooding is also the second most deadly uh, weather-related hazard, second to heat. So it is um, something that we really need to make sure that we are planning for. And then um, last statistic about uh, flooding is our flooding season tends to be in the winter and spring months. Um, and then severe storm is when we would have that flash flooding threat and that those are most likely again in the spring. So uh, when we really need to be uh, making sure that our all of our drainage and everything is up to date and cleared is during those winter and spring months when they could potentially be clogged by snow as well. All right, so now that we kind of have a basis on what about flooding is so impactful and what we need to as to pay attention to as planners, um, I want to talk about the National Flood Insurance Program, which is um, the program that I run for New, or um, I am currently running for New Hampshire, and this is a volunteer or voluntary partnership between FEMA and participating communities in New Hampshire. We have, um, I believe, it's uh, 219 or 220. I forget the exact number, but um, we have over 90 percent of our communities participating in the National Flood Insurance Program in New Hampshire. So that's. We have a really great participation um, rate. And the purpose of the program is to reduce loss of life and property, um, reduce the rising disaster relief costs, because if this flooding keeps happening over and over again, um, we're going to eventually uh, drain the banks there. And uh, it's also to increase the importance of hazard mitigation and help uh, help streamline your hazard mitigation plans uh, in terms of flooding hazards. And then uh, part of the planning side of things that we're able to do is restore and protect the natural resources and functions of floodplains. Um, and then additionally, FEMA uh, uh, provides a, a federally backed uh, insurance for um, houses that are within the floodplain. And uh, the flood insurance program kind of works uh, through three ways. It works by knowing your risk or in uh, producing floodplain maps um, and then reducing your risk through regulations. That's where us as planners, uh, we would come in by um, putting in floodplain management sections within our ordinance. And then uh, the last part is to ensure your risk through 
um, flood insurance, either through FEMA or um, private insurance. And uh, this is a team effort between FEMA, um, the Office of Planning and Development's floodplain management program, and the individual communities within New Hampshire. So the flood maps are one of the most, or one of the largest aspects of floodplain management. And um, they can be a little complicated to understand, but we do need to make sure that um, we are aware of where the floodplain is in our um, communities and what zoning regulations would apply um, for development within that area. So the special, there, this image that I have here on the right is a uh, screenshot taken of the flood insurance rate map for Concord. And it shows the special flood hazard area in blue um, that is labeled as zone AE. So all of this blue area is the special flood hazard area. And that's defined as the 100 year flood. And that means every year there's a 1% chance that you will see a flood of that extent. And there's different zones within the special flood hazard area that have different uh, national or NFIP regulations. So zone A um, is, we know that this is within the 100 year floodplain, but there are no, um, designated like values for the height of those floodwaters. And so any any development within zone A has to get an elevation certificate for construction. It has to, um, the engineer has to conduct a hydrologic study to make sure that um, any the development will be above that base flood elevation. Now, zone AE, which is shown here in Concord, all the base flood elevations have already been mapped out and determined for this. Um, the, sorry, the, uh, got distracted by the chat for a second. Um, so in zone AE, you have all of these base flood elevations um, listed on the map. And um, that is the height that the 100 year flood would reach. And so the zoning regulations for building in that area is um, generally across the board for New Hampshire uh, that you have to build one foot above the base flood elevation. And then within the special flood hazard area, there is the floodway. This is the um, striped red and uh, blue area. Now the floodway is where the uh, high or the heaviest flow of water will be during a flood, and so um, communities that have a mapped floodway. Not every community has a mapped floodway yet. Um, it's something eventually FEMA would like to do, but um, just trying to map out the most populated areas initially. So the communities that already do have a mapped floodway. Um, have to have a section of the zoning ordinance that says that um, you cannot, or any development within the floodway cannot raise the base flood elevation by any amount, um, which generally means that no fill is able to be placed in the floodway. Um, and also, there should be no alteration of the drainage within the floodway because that area has to be reserved for the most intense floodwaters to get out of the way. And, um, sorry, I'm losing my voice a little bit. Um, outside of the special flood hazard area, FEMA has mapped the 500 year floodplain in kind of this brownish orange here. Now this is not, this is an area that we would say is a moderate risk. Um, it is known that there is a higher than average flood risk in this area, but development does not necessarily have to 
comply with the National Flood Insurance Program regulate er, requirements for any development within the 500 year floodplain. Um, that is the map is just mostly showing that there is a known flood risk here, but not enough to require um, uh, more restrictive development rules. And lastly, I talked about this earlier a little bit, but base flood elevation is the height of the flood waters um, and er, for, within the for the hundred year flood. And sometimes they are shown as cross sections across the river where all along this line, the base flood elevation is 232 feet. Um, however, an area over here, the base flood elevation, I can't quite read that number, but I believe it's 235. That, that would say that the edge of the special flood hazard area right here is at 235 feet. So any development within this area has to be uh, one foot above 235 feet. And um, last thing I wanted to mention is that all development within the floodplain, uh, whether that's the 100 year floodplain or the floodway, has to have a floodplain development permit. Now, some communities have that built into the building permit. Some communities have an additional floodplain development permit. Um, it depends on what your community has adopted, but all development has to have um, that permit and you have to designate or say whether or not this uh, development is within the designated floodway. If it is, um, it has to follow all of the other requirements that are set in the zoning ordinance. So the, the flood insurance rate map um, changes over time. And that's because development happens, which changes the flow of the water. Um, weather patterns also change. And so we we know this and uh, FEMA w likes to update the flood maps every decade or so um, to make sure that it's accounted for all of the new development and changes in the weather patterns. And additionally, modeling techniques and data collection have improved over the last decade as well. So um, FEMA likes to use the newest data uh, collection methods and modeling to uh, give the best and most accurate flood maps that they can. And they're currently in the process of remapping the floodplains across the entire state of New Hampshire through the risk map process. Um, and the risk map process, I'm going to go over in detail uh, next. It is a multi-year process of collecting data, uh, um, developing maps, and then adopting them within the community. So um, the risk map process is uh, officially nine steps, but there's kind of three phases of it. It starts with the data collection phase, um, which is called the discovery process. Um, this discovery process takes about one to two years where um, FEMA will have a meeting with the community to get a comprehensive pictures of the flooding issues within the community, the flood risk, any potential flood mitigation activities, including adoption of more restrictive floodplain management criteria. Um, the, during this meeting, they also determine the flooding sources and extent of the watershed that needs a detailed flood study. Um, and this includes determining base flood elevations, floodways, and incorporating any effective letter of map change, revision, or amendments into the study. And those letters are uh, something a homeowner can or a developer can submit after a map is um, published that says, oh, we have um, altered the terrain in uh, by 
doing this and they provide scientific information uh, to say that this area is no longer in um, the flood risk that was published initially. And then after the flood study and the data collection is complete, FEMA holds what's called a consultation coordination officer meeting. Um, that would be this CCO meeting right here. And that happens generally about three years after the initial uh, pro mapping process has begun. And this is where the preliminary flood insurance rate maps and flood insurance studies reports are reviewed by the community um, and any officials that were involved within the mapping study. And after the CCO meeting, FEMA will publish a notice of proposed flood hazard determinations in the Federal Register and at least twice in the local newspaper um, to notify the public that there are new floodplain maps that are uh, going to be ready for review. And then about a month or two after the consultation coordination officer meeting, um, FEMA initiates the 90 day appeal period um, where communities and property owners can submit appeals about new or modified information on the flood insurance rate map. And this can include new or modified base flood elevations, uh, special flood hazard area boundaries, road maps, um, or road locations, names, and other base map features that uh, might be incorrect on the initial map. And uh, you must submit scientific or technical information as evidence for this change. And then once the appeal period happens, that's a, a three month period, FEMA resolves all of the appeals and finalizes the maps. Now that takes, it can take anywhere from a year to two years, depending on how many amendments uh, and revisions are requested. Now, after all the appeals are resolved, FEMA is going to send communities what's called a letter of final determination, or yeah, letter of final determination, which establishes the flood insurance rate map and flood insurance study effective dates, and the um, it uh, finalizes the flood hazard data. Now, this starts the six month period where communities have to adopt or amend their floodplain management regulations within the ordinance uh, to reference the new map date and title before the maps become effective. Now, so FEMA gives you a six month period to make these adoptions and in New Hampshire, I know that we have um, a bit of a weird schedule for allowing um, any changes to the ordinance. And we do have a clause um, in RSA that uh, does account for that. So I'm going to tell you where um, different watersheds are within this process right now. <clears throat> so, we have uh, Northern New Hampshire at the moment is in the early stages of um, their mapping process. So they are in the work map development stage, uh, which means they're in the data collection and modeling um, stage. So both of those are ongoing and they're likely going to um, still be ongoing for the next year or so. And then we have some uh, watersheds uh, down in Cheshire County. We have the Merrimack watershed within Merrimack County, and then the Piscataqua and Salmon Falls watershed in uh, Rockingham County. Are Those ones have their preliminary maps coming out soon, which means the initial maps have been reviewed and the preliminary ones are just about ready for release. And then after you have the preliminary maps, then um, you, the appeal period would start. And we have several uh, counties and watersheds that are in the appeal process at the moment, or their appeal period is going to be starting within the next few months. And that is Belknap County and along the uh, Lake Winnipesaukee. We have all of Stratford County, 
they're about to have their uh, meeting or their appeal period starting very soon. Um, we have Eastern Hillsborough County and the Kentucky watershed of Merrimack County. And finally, the, the areas that are furthest along the mapping process um, is Western Hillsborough County and the Merrimack watershed within Rockingham County. Both of these areas have their letter of final determination coming out soon. Um, soon meaning within the next six months or so. Um, no, these, I don't give specific dates because um, the dates fluctuate a lot. And these are just the latest estimates that I have gotten from FEMA. <clears throat> All right, so what does this mean for your community? What does your community have to pay attention to throughout this process? So um, every community is, is expected to work with FEMA during the data collection um, and during the initial meeting, um, identify what are the known flooding issues in the community, um, what what is uh, recurring flooding areas, what uh, used to be a flooding area, but something has changed and no longer is um, a concern. And then uh, once the maps and everything are released, um, the community is expected to update the floodplain ordinance to ensure compliance with the National Flood Insurance Program. Um, uh, the Office of Planning and Development, um, or me, essentially, will be contacting your local floodplain or zoning administrator, whoever kind of serves in that position, um, to review the ordinance or the floodplain ordinance and recommend changes before the new maps are published. Um, we have model ordinances for um, the state of New Hampshire. It depends on which flood zones um, your community has. Um, and each of these model ordinances is fully compliant with the National Flood Insurance Program. So if um, your community is thinking about updating their ordinance, I would recommend reaching out to me to request um, one of the model ordinances to uh, kind of compare. And while I am doing the ordinance review, um, I'll be providing lang er, required language updates so that the ordinance can be fully compliant and ready for new map adoption. And um, I will be providing you with the recommended uh, language and essentially just this needs to get deleted here and you should change this words or this language to, to say this. Um, now, we try to make sure this is done well ahead of the adoption period so that all the town hall and public review schedules um, will be followed and we're not going to run into any issues with that. And um, the last few things uh, is once the new maps are published or about to be published, um, uh, just notifying the residents holding a public open house um, is uh, required just so that everyone is aware that the floodplain maps are going to be changing um, and your property might now be required to uh, purchase flood insurance. And then uh, lastly, just adopt the new map once it's published and then enforce the floodplain ordinance. That is the biggest thing um, through just at for as long as your community is participating in the National Flood Insurance Program, we are expecting um, the community is actively enforcing the floodplain ordinance. So how do you actually go about adopting these new maps? Um, so again, the maps must be adopted and updated to the latest flood insurance rate map before the map becomes effective. Um, that's very important because failure to do so may result in probation or subs suspension from the National Flood Insurance Program. This actually happened to Biddeford, Maine last year when their map got effective. 
um, they had a 30 day waiting period um, where they were in suspension because the uh, dates were not updated soon enough. So in New Hampshire, we have a specific RSA that allows New Hampshire municipalities to adopt the new flood insurance rate map and flood insurance study report through a resolution of by the gov local governing body. I uh, pasted the exact text right here um, from the RSA, which says that the amendments to uh, the flood insurance rate maps shall apply to local floodplain ordinances upon their adoption of, by resolution of the local governing body of a municipality and shall require no further action by the local legislative body. So you can only amend the firm and the FIS date through this RSA. Um, any other changes to the ordinance must have been done previously or wait until the next um, available period or the next period where um, that will be able to happen. Um, yeah, so any other amendments have to follow the regular procedures. And right here, I just put an example of what this actually looks like. So literally just the dates right here um, for the flood insurance study and the flood insurance rate map um, are what is able to be updated. So I just wanted to reiterate, so the possibility of suspension um, means it's very serious. Um, it means that property owners will not be able to purchase national flood insurance policies and all existing policies will not be renewed for the entire town. And uh, for the community, this also means that federal grants or loans for development will not be available um, and federal disaster assistance will not be provided uh, to repair insurance insurable buildings within the special flood hazard area. And uh, additionally, the, the reason I brought up um, enforcement is suspension can also happen if the community is allowing non-compliant or unpermitted development. That's why um, I reiterate that all development within the floodplain, you have to make sure that it is permitted and um, make sure you double check that this property is or is not in the floodplain. So <clears throat> I'm going to, uh, that's kind of the whole process that concerns um, the planning side of things for the National Flood Insurance Program. Um, I put some resources here at the end of the um, slides for um, just some very helpful uh, areas. So I have our website from the Office of Planning and Development linked here um, on the first link. And then to actually view the new maps, um, the flood map changes viewer is how you would do that to view any maps that are in their prelim preliminary stage already. Um, and then the National Flood Hazard Layer is uh, where you can view the maps that are currently in effect. Um, and then flood insurance at uh, FEMA.gov is just some general information on the National Flood Insurance Program. And then this last link I think will be the most helpful for um, all the planners here is um, how the adoption of the flood insurance rate maps actually happens. And it goes over each of those um, steps I had talked about in a lot more detail um, and the dates that or like the time periods that are allowed uh, for each of those steps to happen within. All right, so um, that is all I had for um, the presentation today. And we do have about 10 minutes left um, where if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them, um, whether it's to do with the uh, flooding or planning, anything about the National Flood Insurance Program. So I'm just seeing a few uh, questions that I think came in during the presentation. So doesn't re FEMA require first floor to be two foot 
feet above base flood elevations? So uh, that's a good question because it depends on the community. For New Hampshire, well, the exact uh, requirements through FEMA is that it has to be at at least the base flood elevation. New Hampshire has a higher standard where it has to be at least a foot above the base flood elevation. Some communities are participating in what's called the community rating system, which is a program that if you're already in the National Flood Insurance Program, um, you can elect to have higher standards within your floodplain management ordinance um, to protect uh, the local houses even more. And FEMA provides those communities with a discounted insurance rate um, if they have higher standards. And so if you're in one of those communities, they might require um, uh, any uh, development to be two feet above base flood elevation. So I think that's where um, you might see requirements for two feet. But the uh, FEMA requirement is just that it has to be at least as high as the base flood elevation. Um, if you already have an ordinance, what do you update? And should you set, should I send uh, me the, uh, should you send me the new ordinance to review? Um, when it comes time to do the ordinance review, I will, um, if your town has an ordinance posted online, I will grab that one. If um, I see that it's pretty old, I will reach out and just ask if you guys have an updated ordinance. And um, it depends on what you're going to have to update. So some ordinances have not been updated since FEMA um, has put in some new requirements for the National Flood Insurance Program. So they might have changed a definition here or a definition there. Um, and if that's the case, I literally just go through a Word document of the ordinance and I just like highlight the area or the text that I um, recommend gets deleted and or replaced. And I will literally just put in the new text where it should go within the ordinance. And so um, what you guys at the community would have to do is just kind of accept all of those changes and make the edits or approve the edits that I had made and then um, bring it over to the planning board um, or um, yeah then actually get it officially updated within the community and so that's that's kind of how that works if um, the so I will, if like one of the th major changes that could happen is if your community didn't used to have a floodway, but then FEMA has now mapped out a floodway, that's going to add in some new requirements for the uh, local floodplain ordinance. And I um, am going to like make sure that um, the, um, the required language for that new zone is actually incorporated into the ordinance. Um, all right, how do municipalities weigh in on the appeal period? So FEMA sends out, um, or they send out an email to the local town administrator, um, building inspector, um, just generally anyone who's involved within planning and development um, within the community. And um, so they will be at the consultation coordination officer meeting, or at least invited to the meeting. And <clears throat> at that meeting, FEMA provides the contact information of the person um, that is uh, kind of responsible for fielding all of the appeals and reviews for that particular map panel. Um, and so at that meeting, uh, FEMA would give you all the contact information uh, to do that. And then 
Uh, next question, am I correct that base flood elevation is a surface elevation? Should elevation be added to that for a basement or septic system, for example? So, all right. Um, yeah, the base flood elevation is the surface of the water during a hundred year flood. So, like if the water um, expanded to cover that entire 100 year flood plain, this is how high that water would be. Um, and for a basement, um, generally basements are, there's very specific rules on how you could build a basement within the flood plain. Generally, it's not allowed. Um, or if it is allowed, it has to be flood proofed, which means installing flood vents um, and using flood resistant material on the basement. And um, generally the town building inspector and also the engineer that's working on the project should uh, be very fluent and um, with the requirements for like below grade construction is what we would call it. Um, <clears throat> so does the state model ordinance incorporate elevation requirements referenced in the new state building code um, as there are flood design classes for residential and non-residential to ensure local ordinances are compliant with both? Yes, um, yeah, they do. So the state model ordinances are fully compliant with the international building code, the state building code, the national flood insurance program requirements so these are the um the gold standard for um ordinances that are fully compliant with every regulation um that the state has in place all right uh oh i um realize i missed one here how um so our ordinances can only be changed through town meetings for our community do you have the timeline or do I have the timeline for fiscal year 26, 27 correct? Um, I don't have the town ordinate or um, I don't have the timeline here off the top of my head, but um, that RSA that I was referring to here is what allows the map dates to be updated outside of that regular uh, town meeting schedule. But the only thing you can update is the date, nothing else. Um, so that's why I like to do the ordinance reviews well ahead of that date, just so that during the next meeting schedule, um, you should be able to bring these uh, ordinance updates and make make sure that um, everything is updated before um, you need you're in that period of um, six months to adopt the uh, new map dates. Um, how do we obtain the current state model ordinance? Uh, you email me, uh, Tara, I, I know I need to uh, respond to your email. Um, I will do that as soon as uh, this meeting ends and give you the latest model ordinance. Um, and that that's only because it um, it depends on what flood zone is in with your, your community. There's um, if your community only has zone A, for instance, um, you would be following um, the model ordinance A. If you have um, zone AE, uh, which has base flood elevations, then um, that would be model B ordinance. If there's a mapped floodway, that would be a model C ordinance. If you're a coastal community, that's a model D ordinance. Um, so it it just depends on um, which, uh, like what zone is in your community. Uh, yes, I will make sure I email everybody who has requested model ordinance. Um, I will um, uh, send those out. Um, Yes, so the preliminary maps are downloadable on FEMA's website through the Map Service Center. Um, it's a little clunky to get to it. So what I would recommend is um, going to this flood map changes viewer and um, looking at what panel number 
it uh, is over the area um, for the, the map that you're looking for, and then go to the map service center and type in that exact panel number to download it. Um, that's the best way that I've found to try to get the pre preliminary maps. Otherwise, it's it's literally only listed by the um, uh, by the panel number, and so you can't actually like view it on like you can't view the map to know if you even have the right area beforehand. So that's why I recommend like look it up on the flood map changes viewer initially, and then go download the map panel from the map service center. Um, I have, I can put the link to the map service center in the chat here. Um, all right. All right, there I put in the chat, is the link to the flood map service center um that's where you can go to actually physic down or download the map panels all right um we are at one o'clock so uh, unless there's any further questions um i appreciate everybody uh attending today and um, yeah, please uh, shoot me an email if you want the state model ordinance or if you want some more information on the National Flood Insurance Program or any updates on um, what where your community is at um, within the MAP process. But all right, again, uh, thank you for coming out and I'll, we'll see you at next month's meeting. <laughs> all right. Bye, guys.